Good day, everyone. Welcome to ICSS, Sunday morning at the Marxist Library. My name is Sharon Rose, and I'm today's moderator. ICSS stands for Institute for Critical Study of Society. And we were formed at the Mar Nebel Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, California in 2004 to preserve Marxist heritage and to support struggles for social justice and struggle for socialism leading to communism. The opinions expressed in our forum are only of those of the speakers, but we all are united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx, who in his 11th thesis on Feuerbach said, the philosopher has interpreted the world in different ways. The point, however, is to change it. For the last year, we've been meeting remotely via the internet, and we are happy to be able to include people from around the, the United States and around the world. Our local attendees have every intention to return to meeting at the library, but we also intend to keep our virtual participants as well. Our format on Sunday mornings is for our speaker to present for about an hour and then have an hour of discussion. I will call on people and keep the stack. At the end of the two hours, we turn off the recording and have a half hour of more informal discussion, which is still moderated. Our speaker today is Roger Harris. Roger is a member of the ICSS Program Committee, and he is active with the human rights organization, the Task Force on the Americas, and is on the Executive Committee of the U.S. Peace Council. His work can be found in Counterpunch, Dissident Voice, Mint Press News, Popular Resistance, and the Orinoco Tribune. I will put the links to the two articles Roger recommended, two of his articles, in the chat. Uh, by way of introduction, Roger wrote, Biden bellicosely proclaimed America is back in his major foreign policy priorities speech, reaffirming the bipartisan consent, consensus of regi regime change, forever wars, and the NATO alliance. Republican neocons now shelter in the Democrats' big tent, today's party of war. Biden's policies will follow his predecessors, but will more effectively target official enemies, such as Venezuela and Iran, and will double down on Russia and China. Roger will speak about the current intentions of the U.S. empire and how progressives anti-imperialists and anti-militarists should view the impending crisis. So, Roger, please take it away. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you everybody for joining us. But particularly, I want to thank you for being part of the struggle against US imperialism, because that's really the key thing. Let me now do a share screen. Um, it'll take one moment to do this. We can see it. You might want to maximize your window. I, I you think go. it's maximized now? Yes, that's good. Okay, great. Um, so th this presentation addresses the foreign policy of the current occupant in the White House, but more precisely is an exposition on U.S. imperial project. The U.S. foreign policy reflects the personal qualities of the person occupying the White House, in this case, Biden, his party affiliation, and the constellation of state and corporate powers behind that administration. But eclipsing all those factors our larger geopolitical developments, especially now that larger political development is the emergence of China as the world's workshop. Now, I'm gonna begin with Biden when he was still auditioning to be the emperor. And he wrote an article, or actually his handlers wrote the article 
um, in Foreign Affairs. And Foreign Affairs is the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations. And um, for those of you who are familiar with Larry Shoup, who's been associated with the lib library for many, many years, um, he's probably the leading expert on the left on the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a quasi-governmental organization that is, in effect, the think tank for imperialism. And so when you publish something in their journal, the Journal of Foreign Affairs, then um, you're, you're really stating what imperial policy is. So we have here um, the, the article that Biden posted, and it says, why America must lead again, rescuing the U.S. foreign policy from Trump. And in a, in a simple and he sets out what you might call the five principles of U.S. imperialism. So the first principle is that Biden says the Biden foreign policy agenda will place the United States back at the head of the table. So what is he saying there? He's saying, hey, boys and girls, this is not a multipolar world. This is not a world where there's sovereign nations. This is a world where the United States is at the head of the table. And the only states other than the United States are vassal states. And then second, he says, the world does not organize itself. What he's saying is principle number two of U.S. imperialism, the United States organizes the world. And then he goes on that since World War II, Democrats and Republicans have had a bipartisan policy. So that, that's telling you folks, you know, what you see on TV about Democrats and Republicans not really agreeing with each other, that, that's for home consumption. But when it comes to imperialism, it's a bipartisan policy. Um, principle number four is about writing the rules. And this one's qu quite clear. There's rules to the international order the United States writes them, you obey them. And then the fifth rule is the fifth principle of, that he's saying, putting forward, is that, well, I'll read it here. Um, if we continue his, uh, Trump's advocation of, what, of that responsibility, that is being the world's ruler, then one of two things will happen. Either someone else will take the United States' place but in a way that advances, that does not advance our interests and values, or no one will, and chaos will ensure. So what he's telling the world here is that the world has two choices, at least from the point of view of U.S. imperialism. One choice is to accept U.S. rule. The other choice is chaos. And in this context, in this nuclear age, chaos means a nuclear conflagration. And I'll get to that toward the end of this presentation. Now, the next thing I want to do is play a video clip of Trump because Biden is responding to Trump. And um, I'd like you to listen to it. Um, it might be difficult, but I'd like you to listen to Trump's word. This is Trump as a sitting president. But listen to it as if you were a member of the ruling elite. And you're saying, is this the guy who we elected to be the CEO of the capitalist world? So let's listen to what Trump has to say. The plan is to get out of endless wars, to bring our soldiers back home, to not be policing agents all over the world. If you look at other countries, Russia, China... They don't have countries to take care of. We have, we're close to 90 countries in one form or another. We're in 90 countries all over the world policing. And frankly, many of those countries, they don't respect what we're doing. They don't even like what we're doing and they don't like us. Now, we were able to hear that? Good. Um, so what Trump said, these iconoclastic words, they never found their way into, into policy. Now, we could discuss in the Q&A maybe why they didn't get into policy, whether it had to do with the permanent state or whether Trump was, was not really mean, meaning this. But in any case, we can be sure <clears throat> that Biden's speechwriters will never give him words like that to utter. In fact, when Biden made his first major foreign policy speech at the Munich Security 
conference on on February 19th, he bellowed closely proclaimed, America is back. He repeated it twice to make sure that it was clear that the Trump interregnum was over. And these were words that were the most reassuring words to the neocons, the um, George W. Bush's former defense secretary, Colin Powell, and 70 odd Republican national security um, officials wrote during the uh, presidential election, um, they supported uh, Trump, uh, excuse me, Biden. And because they were worried that if Biden didn't win, the bipartisan foreign policy consensus would be overturned. And the bipartisan foreign policy consensus is one, regime change, two, forever wars, and three, the military alliance led by NATO. Today, Republican neocons shelter in the Democrats' big tent, which is now today's party of war. Perhaps the biggest difference from Biden and his predecessor is that the U.S. president now promises a greater reliance on multilateral diplomacy and international cooperative agreements. However, these agreements and this diplomacy is designed to achieve U.S. imperial goals. Diplomacy does not mean dialoguing with official U.S. enemies like Kim Jong-un of North Korea or Maduro of Venezuela. Rather, it means pressing the vassal states to join the U.S. imperial initiatives. And we should add that there were some things that Biden did was good. He returned to the World Health Um organization, the uh, Climate Accords, um, the U.S. Human Rights Council, and he uh, abrogated Trump's uh, Muslim ban. ban. Regardless of the changing of guard in, in Washington, the imperial goal of full spectrum dominance endures from one administration to the next. That never changes. And the global network of some 800 to maybe 1,000 or more U.S. foreign military bases, those won't be shuttered. The fact that the U.S. can with impunity punish a third of humanity, that's 39 nations, with illegal sanctions, what the U.N. calls unilateral coercive measures, is a measure of the U.S.'s hegemonic standing. These sanctions are a form of hybrid warfare, which can be just as deadly as outright war. Although Biden is reviewing the sanctions policy, considering the COVID-19 pandemic, he will keep, quote, using the U.S. sanctions weapon, but with a sharper aim. And that's according to Reuters. Let me go into what that sharper aim looks like. Just in one area, the imperialist vaccine apartheid. Biden invoked the defense priorities and allocation system that comes under the Defense Production Act and requires manufacturers to meet domestic orders first before international. Some 30 vital items needed for mass vaccination are covered by this act. And what the result was is that foreign countries, particularly India, was unable to get some vital products. The head of the largest vaccine producer in the world, a... um, a Indian firm um, wrote to Biden and said, "Please let us get some of these vi- some of these key uh, ingredients because we can't produce vaccines without those ingredients." Of course, he didn't get them. Uh, Northwest University study um, argued that if the first two billion vaccine doses were distributed evenly worldwide, deaths from COVID would have been reduced by sixty one percent. But if the world's richest 47 countries hoarded vaccines, which they did, deaths would only fall by 33%. The World Health Organization reports that 87% of vaccines have gone to the wealthiest countries. At the other end of that spectrum are the low-income countries, which received less than 1% of the world's supply of vaccines. The U.S. and the United Kingdom alone at, by the end of March had produced 180 million doses of vaccine, none of which were exported 
In contrast, China exported 166, 166 million doses and kept 196 million doses for domestic use. Now, I'll just mention about the United States' closest ally and partner, and that is Israel, which um, is now engaged in intensification of, of genocide against the Palestinian people. Uh, Israel now leads the world in getting its population vaccinated. Some 80, 60% of Israelis are vaccinated. In contrast, 3% of the Palestinians are immunized. And those are the ones that are domestic workers who come in contact with Jews. This is what imperialism looks like. Anthony Blanken the new secretary of Blinken, excuse me, the new secretary of state asserted that his politics will follow his predecessor, so that is Trump, but will more effectively target official enemies such as Venezuela and will double down on Russia. And following Trump, the Biden administration is appealing to the United Kingdom's high court to extradite Julian Assange. Going back to Biden's foreign policy speech, Biden says, we're at an inflection point. And he warned about the competition, quote, the competition among countries that threaten to divide the world caused by shifting global dynamics, end quote. The threat of dividing the world that concerns the United States is precisely any deviation from U.S. domination. Biden was referring to the emergence of potential rival powers. His warning affirms and extends Trump's 2017 national security doctrine of great power competition and swings away from Obama's earlier and subsequently abandoned concept of international interdependence. Biden's shifting global dynamics are what the Obama's defense secretary Chuck Hagel referred to as, quote, challenging the world order that American leadership helped build after World War II. In other words, the world's sole superpower is adverse to an emerging multipolar world. Biden's speech concluded, we're at an inflection point caused by the new crises. While not identified by Biden, this implicit recognition of the impending crisis of legitimacy is the it's recognition of Biden's, it's Biden's recognition of the impending crisis of legitimacy of the neoliberal world order. The United States is the main beneficiary, proponent and enforcer of the global political economy that is increasingly seen as failing to meet people's needs. Class disparities during the economic recession are ever more evident in the United States and internationally. For example, here in the United States, billionaires have added $4 trillion to their net worth since the onset of the pandemic. Rather, Biden said in his foreign policy speech that the United States is fully committed to our NATO alliance and welcomes Europe's growing investment in military capabilities. The U.S. mission in Iraq is being expanded and more troops are being sent to Germany. Biden justifies the NATO military encirclement of Russia with intimations that Ukraine and Georgia may eventually join the NATO alliance by the threat of Russia. But really, the Russians' reactions to having hostile war games and nuclear-capable facilities on its own border are clearly reactions that are defensive and not offensive. Meanwhile, the U.S. military alliance has long since broken loose from its Atlantic-centric borders with NATO and now has what they call partners across the globe, extending to Afghanistan, Australia, Colombia, and Latin America, Iraq, Japan, Republic of Korea, Mongolia, New Zealand, and Pakistan. Now, this particular graphic comes from a U.S. government website. And with 
imperial chutzpah. It sort of shows a whole continent, Africa, and sort of says, what's the problem with each one of these countries? Now, imagine just if, if some African country on their website their official website had a picture of the United States and then listed all the different problems in, Cal in California and Georgia, um, New York, and so on. So on. Um, anyway, this is put out by AFRICOM, which is the um, African command of, of the U.S. military. And the new administration will expand U.S. military presence in Africa. In 2019, the United States Special Forces deployed in 22 countries and was active in active combat in 13 of them. That's wars. The largest ever U.S. military exercise in Africa is called Africa. African Lions 21 is scheduled to begin next month. We'll go back to um, African continent and just mention something about Egypt. Uh, Biden's State Department recently approved a $200 million arms sale to Egypt, a country headed by the man Trump called his favorite dictator. The U.S. is and continues to be the world's largest purveyor of military equipment. And compared to the rest of the world, the United States sales of military equipment eclipse the combined sales of the next four highest war profiteers. Oil and gas are strategic resources and their international flows are key factors for imperial control. Russia would be a minor economy eclipse absent oil and gas sales. Um, oil and gas constitutes 60% of the Russian gross national, uh, gross domestic product. Now that the US is a net ex oil exporter, the Gulf oil rich Gulf monarchies are both allies and potential competitors of the United States. Trump extended the US's special relationship to the middle in the Middle East with Israel and the Saudi Arabia. Biden continues on that trajectory. Trump's provocative, Trump's provocative move of the US embassy to Jerusalem will not be reversed by Biden nor will Palestinian rights be recognized. Biden announced that the U.S. will no longer support offensive operations in the Saudi-led war in Yemen, which has precipitated an incredibly terrible human rights catastrophe. It remains to be seen what, quote, defensive lethal aid to the Saudis will entail. The Saudis, by the way, have the world's fifth largest military, costing an astronomical 8% of their gross, national, gross domestic product. Um, some military sales to Saudi Arabia have been um, suspended, as they are, have been suspended to the United Arab Emirates, but this is only a temporary suspension. And in response to that suspension, the CEO of military merchant Raytheon comment, commented, quote, Peace is not going to break out in the Middle East anywhere soon. And he should know because the current Secretary of War had just left his board of directors. Let's go to Iran. Ignoring nuclear armed Israel, the Biden team continues the U.S.'s obsession with Iran's nuclear program. Biden has committed to renegotiate a better deal regarding Iran after Trump withdrew from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. However, the better deal that Biden envisions is really the deal that Trump had been pushing all along. Is that that not is to go beyond the nuclear issue in Iran and take on the whole Iran foreign policy. Just after a month in office, Biden bombed Syria. It bombed Syria because its assets were threatened in Iraq. And he did that to get even with Iran. The Mainstream press, the corporate press, was ecstatic. Bloomberg yelled, Biden's first military attack, attack should wake up Iran. Now, just imagine, if Iran bombed the United States, would we call that a wake-up call? And the CNN is even worse. Um, I'm going to have to change my screen here. 
um, Biden sends uh, CNN says Biden sends a message to Iran with a scalpel instead of a sledgehammer. Now, if you were being bombed, I don't think you'd exactly think that that was a sledge, a scalpel. So next, what I'd like to do is talk, um, mention some of the responses to this first militaristic, major militaristic act by Biden. And we have here um, Biden supporter Suzanne Lampion, and she treated such a quiet attack, no drama, no TV coverage of the bombs hitting targets, no comments on how presidential Biden is. What a difference. Democratic organizer Amy Siskin treated so different having military action under Biden. No middle school level threats on Twitter. Trust Biden and his team's competence. And where is the left wing of the Democratic Party? Well, they're posing for photo ops with the symbol of the Democratic Party establishment, Nancy Pelosi whom they now call Mama Bear. In the Washington Post, one of the print journals of the empire, um, brags that Biden has tamed the left. Let's hear another view. I am glad to hear that some of my former colleagues in Congress are speaking out against the recent unconstitutional airstrikes in Syria, but they're ignoring the bigger issue. The regime change war the United States continues to wage in Syria using Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, HTS terrorists as our proxy ground force and who now occupy and control the city of Idlib, imposing Sharia law and cleansing the area of most Christians and religious minorities. The Biden administration continues to use our military to illegally occupy northeastern Syria to, quote, take the oil as Trump so crassly, but honestly put it, violating international law. Now, modern day siege of draconian embargo and sanctions, similar to what the Saudi US alliance employed in Yemen is causing death and suffering for millions of innocent Syrians, depriving them of things like food, medicine, clean water, energy, warmth, and making it impossible for the Syrian people to try to begin to rebuild their war-torn country. That's Tulsi Gabbard, no longer in the U.S. Congress. Let's go on to Latin America and the Caribbean. Treatment of Latin America and the Caribbean as the U.S.'s proprietary backyard came under the 1823 Monroe Doctrine. This doctrine is over is nearly 200 years old but instead of becoming obsolete, the U.S. empire has extended it to around the world and even into space. <clears throat> On the positive side, there is a possibility of a rising pink tide in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is challenging U.S. hegemony south of the border. And for examples, there are the recent electoral leftist electoral wins in Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, and Peru, um, there's an open Marxist-Leninist who's running for the presidency. Um, that, that, that election will be on uh, June 6th, and um, he's leading in the polls right now. This continued resistance by Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua to the U.S. domination, and Colombia is in revolt against the U.S.-backed narco state, which is a very significant development. Let's go to Cuba in particular. Biden, the day he entered office, had the power of executive order to restore Obama's openings to Cuba that had been reversed to, by Trump. Now, nearly four months later, Biden has not ended limits on res remittances, nor on restrictions on travel, nor on other illegal sanctions on Cuba. 242 hostile measures adopted by Trump remain in force. And this is in addition to the Trump um, State Department, which labeled Cuba a terrorist nation that hasn't been reversed either. Biden continues the illegal policy of regime change for Cuba that has been the policy of the previous 12 
presence, a seamless policy. And it has three major components. One, covert and overt destabilization. The blockade, which is asphyxiating the people of Cuba. And the occupation of Guantanamo. Obama's openings to Cuba were not a deviation from previous policy, but an attempt to achieve regime change by different means. Venezuela featured prominently in the presidential campaign speeches speeches of both Trump and Biden, with both promoting regime change. The U.S. anointed counterfeit president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido, has lost his credentials with the European Union, but the farce initiated by Trump in 2019 is nonetheless being continued by Biden who backed down on his campaign, pledged to possibly negotiate directly with the democratically elected president, Nicolas Maduro. In Haiti, despite a massive popular uprising against Jovenel Moish in Haiti, Biden has not only backed the dictator, but deported thousands of Haitian emigres, endangering their lives. And this is despite a pledge during the election campaign to reverse Trump's repressive immigration policies. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, this represents a disappointing step backward from the Biden administration's earlier commitments to fully break from the harmful deportation policies of both the Trump and Obama presidencies. This particular photograph is one I took myself. I took it on um, in Arizona, right on the Mexican border. And I went out bird watching early in the morning. And at about the same time I picked, I pulled into this particular parking lot, <clears throat> the border, US border patrol pulled into that parking lot and they were armed to the teeth with military equipment. And they went out on a hunt. As the morning progressed, I came back to the parking lot and there they were And there they were with their quarry, what they had captured. They had captured children. Biden in his first 100 days has deported 300,000 people. And he's well on his way to repeat Obama's 300 million deportations. He's also closed the border to asylum seekers. I'll just uh, deviate from the script that I'm reading here and just sort of say that I had hoped that at least that part of the U.S. legacy would have been reversed of the Trump legacy. But instead, it's gotten worse rather than better with a new president. Let me go on to the other side of the world, Afghanistan, which is now in the 20th year of war. Trump negotiated a peace agreement with the Taliban and the U.S.-backed government in Afghanistan, now in its 20th year of war. The Biden administration had indicated that it will not honor <clears throat> the May date for the U.S. withdrawal. And it's, it's, um, the Biden has extended that to September But in fact, the war will not be over. U.S. military bases will remain. Massive numbers of U.S. military contractors will remain. U.S. covert operatives will remain. And bombing and zone attacks will not be abated in Afghanistan. One moment, please. But then again... Let's look at World War II, which ended in, 2000, in 1945. Japan, Germany, and Italy are still being occupied by U.S. troops. The forever wars continue, which is the nature of the imperialism and the imperial empire. But let's look at some of the fake news that were leaked when there was a fear that Trump might withdraw from, from Afghanistan. And one of the big fake news stories was that Russia secretly offered Afghan militants bounties to kill U.S. troops, intelligence says. Now, as it turns out, um, the U.S. intelligence agency said that they had low confidence, low to moderate confidence, which means they didn't believe the story themselves. Um, But that's... 
that assessment came out after the news was was promulgated by the corporate press. So let's listen to what the corporate press says and how they are an echo chamber for imperialism and particularly how they document their fake news. In our world today, President Trump dismissing the Russian bounty intelligence story as a hoax meant to damage him and Republicans. The president often counts his relationship with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, but the White House also responding tonight to a bombshell report accusing Russia of offering bounties to the Taliban to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan. And now, you know, from this reporting in the New York Times, which has since been confirmed by the Wall Street Journal. So catch that. Rachel Maddow says, the report came from the New York Times, but it has to be true because it was confirmed by the Wall Street Journal. What a beautiful circular logic that is. Not only does the president know that Russia was paying for American soldiers' deaths. News, get this, the Washington Post is now reporting that the alleged Russian bounties to Taliban fighters in Afghanistan are believed to have resulted in the deaths of U.S. troops. Like this New York Times story about a stunning U.S. intel assessment, finding that Russia secretly ordered the offered Afghan militants bounties to kill U.S. troops. So comes under fire of those bombshell reports that the White House was told Russia was paying bounties to kill U.S. troops in Afghanistan. The most important application of that question is what did the president know about Vladimir Putin offering a bounty for the killing of American soldiers in Afghanistan? And when did he know it? A senior Afghan official confirmed to CBS News that the reports were not only true, but the Russian government achieved some success with their plans. Very clearly, I cannot tell a lie, Mackin, that he insists the president does in fact read everything he needs to read. We need to look at the real threat to U.S. troops and the risk that Russia was putting a bounty on their heads. That Americans found out this weekend. Yeah, I think that's enough Enough of that. Let's go on to the People's Democratic Republic of Korea. It is now in the 71st year of official war with the United States with no end in sight. When Trump met with the president of, the, of Korea, uh, President Kim Jong-un, in 2019, the Democrats screamed treason to be sure that Biden will not make the patriotic mistake of trying to reduce tension between two nuclear powers. Far more dangerous, though, is the pivot to Asia. And that's what I want to end this talk with, about talking about the pivot to Asia. The U.S. has ringed China with 400 military bases. Following Obama's pivot to Asia in 2012, Biden's policy portends a continuation of Trump's hostility toward China, only with further intensification. The U.S. military buildup to confine China includes land, air, sea, and even space forces with the South China Sea as the regional hotspot. Here we have a video by um, the new Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, I'll let him speak for himself. With the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to seriously challenge the stable and open international system, all the rules, values, and relationships that make the world work the way we want it to, because it ultimately serves the interests and reflects the values of the American people. Okay, so again, we have this blatantly imperialist, um, unvarnished, admission that we make the rules and we make the rules to make the world work the way we want it to do. In fact, China is an upcoming rival, but it falls short of being a peer of the U.S. in terms of economic power. China's remarkable economic growth has been predicated by its integration in and indeed its dependence on the international capitalist market, which is dominated by the United States. Although China is the world's leading exporter, only a minuscule 4% of international exchange of currencies are denominated in the Chinese currency. And that's compared to 88% of the 
world um, exchange of currencies, 88 88.88% that are in the US dollar. Tellingly, close to half the trade between China and Russia, two countries being sanctioned by the United States, are in currencies other than Chinese or Russian currencies. We'll go on to the new director of national intelligence, that's April Haynes, and she warned Congress about China. She says, China is a near peer competitor challenging the U.S. in multiple areas, especially economically, technologically, militarily, and technologically, and it is pushing global norms. So what norms is it that China is pushing? Well, it could be the norm that China has ended extreme poverty, illiteracy, and the lack of portable water. Because if you look at the rest of the world, particularly the U.S. Um, policy and U.S countries that the U.S. supports, the ending of extreme po poverty, illiteracy, and the access to po potable water, those are, those are not the things that are happening as a global norm. She's the main author of the annual threat assessment that came out just April 9th uh, of this year. And the annual threat assessment of the U.S. Um, intelligence community labels China as the greatest threat to the United States. And it calls for a massive increase in military spending. Oh, excuse me, in, in spending over over a broad spectrum of things, and that includes increased spending for intelligence operations, for cyber attacks against China, uh, for military technology, and very important, the the United States is engaging in a propaganda war, and it's employing reactionary journalists through the mainstream press, but not only through the mainstream press, but so-called human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch, and also social media platforms, including some alternative me media. And let me conclude now with the words of Admiral Charles A. Richard. Um, he's a man who, he's the man who's in charge of the US nuclear fighting capability. He's the guy who's going to launch the next world war, the next nuclear fight. Um, and he warned that a conflict with Russia or China, quote, in a conflict with Russia or China, quote, nuclear employment is a very real possibility. Nuclear war is a very real possibility because and precisely because the U.S. reserves the right of first use of nuclear weapons, China's official policy is not to be the first to use nuclear weapons at any time or in any circumstance. And the Russian policy is to use nuclear weapons only when the very existence of the state is threatened. The U.S. is ringing Russia and China with a missile defense system, with missile defense systems. These had been illegal until George W. Bush abrogated the U.S.-Russian ABM treaty that was in 2002. A missile defense system is designed to shield against a retaliatory response to a first strike, a first nuclear strike. And Congress has um, recently authorized a new generation of U.S. intercontinental ballistic missiles, the ICBMs. A trillion dollar plus nuclear weapon modernization was started by Obama, continued by Trump, and lurches forward under Biden, with the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal scheduled to be upgraded. The consequences are far greater risks of launching an accidental nuclear war and an accelerated arms race. Given such an international climate, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists set the 2021 doomsday clock to 100 seconds before midnight. So this is where my story ends. At 100 seconds before disaster, but that's only half the story. There's another half to the story, and that is the resistance to US imperialism. 
American leadership in the world is touted by both Republicans and Democrats, but it's not democratic. No one elected the United States to be the world's nanny, and international polls show that the U.S. is rated among the most feared, the most hated, and most dangerous countries in the world, and with the greatest threat to world peace. Um, Polls show that majorities or at least pluralities of U.S. people support reducing the military budget, achieving peace by avoiding foreign intervention, negotiating directly with adversaries to avoid military confrontation, decreasing U.S. troops abroad, and constraining the president's ability to attack a foreign adversary. Time is running out. Thank you so much for listening. Sharon, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Roger. Um, before we, we're going to open up for discussion in just a minute, but I thought perhaps, Roger, you wanted to com you'd want to comment on, on the question that Anne put in the chat. She says, I would like to hear more about what Roger thinks of Biden's policy on refugees from Central America. Between AMLO's victory and Biden's win, Aid workers on the Texas border were hopeful for change, especially toward children and families. Now we hear of new concentration camps. What happened? Yes, I mean, I, I kind of broke up on, on that one myself. I mean, I, I didn't have very high hopes for the Biden presidency, but I was kind of hoping that we'd get some relief on that one. Um, and instead of relief, we've gotten just the opposite. Um, he promised on the campaign trail to reverse Trump's policies. Um, and it didn't seem to be that vital to imperialist interests to just allow a few people in. It's a humanitarian thing. Um, but the nature of imperialism is that humanitarian concerns are not their concerns. and. So I really appreciate your comment there. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now we're going to take people raising your hand. Um, and um, I think you have to be in full screen mode to see the, ha the raise hand button under the uh, reactions. And then if you, if you can't see it, you can just raise your hand like this to me. I'll try to see you or if nothing else then not, if i still miss you i'm really sorry you can you can uh, shout out but uh, Karen, before we jump in can we uh, uh also take a break and do the um uh, oh, next week and the... yes. <laughs> okay i'm so sorry we always um we have a short announcement about our upcoming programs and then a short fundraising pitch so uh gene could you could you speak about our next program? Yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. No answer means no. Yes, we, we can hear you. Oh, oh, okay, you can hear me. Okay, well, next week, um, we have another excellent program. Um, uh, Judy um, Greenspan is going to be speaking on the significance of the Alabama Amazon union struggle building solidarity in a time of transformation of the working class. And Judy's been, uh, is a member of uh, uh, Workers World Party as well as Peace and Freedom Party and um, was active in this struggle. She's the Bay Area organizer for supporting that struggle. So that will be very good. Uh, the following week, uh, June 6th, I think, or June 30th, um, we were going to have a session on uh, the events in Tulsa in 1921. It's the 100th anniversary of the actual bombing of the black community of Tulsa and I, slaughtering people in, in the hundreds. But unfortunately, we had to reschedule and we're not, not don't yet have that firmed up. But we're continuing on Sunday, June 13th. We'll be talking about the Communist Party and the Auto Workers uh, Union with Roger Kernan. Um, and I think that deals with uh, the 1930s period. Um, 
So that, we have some very good programs coming up. Uh, thank you all for being with us. And I'll turn it over to Richard, I think. Go ahead, Richard. Thank you, uh, Sharon. Uh, I've just posted in the um, chat information on how you can contribute to our ongoing expenses and support for the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library. Um, you can, of course, send us a check or, uh, or through PayPal or Patreon. You can contribute electronically and it'll be very helpful. Um, I'd like to remind anybody who hasn't contributed or who haven't contributed within the last three or four months um, to please um, make a, a contribution, even a small one. As uh, Raj has pointed out in the past, it's possible to set up through your bank a payment, even a modest payment that goes every month or, uh, or whatever period, and you don't have to, it's, it's auto drive, you don't have to do anything once it's set up, and it'll gradually drain your bank account. But uh, the Institute for Marxist Critical Study of Society would be much better off. So thank you all, and back to you, Sharon. Richard, I don't see your post. I think sometimes you have to hit enter in order to make it go through. You may have written it without hitting enter. I don't know, but check that out. I Please. did hit enter. Well, I'll do it again, but just keep checking the chat and it'll yeah. be there okay. shortly. Sure. Thank you. Um, so um, we have two people in the stack right now. Yusuf, it's your turn and then Jean. Uh, uh, okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, the, uh, I'd like uh, uh, you to elaborate more on the uh, uh, Biden uh, approach to the uh, Iran nuclear deal. Also, some uh, a couple of comments. Um, I, I believe the UK has had trouble exporting the AstraZeneca uh uh, vaccine. Uh, we, we, it was mainly to, to, to the EU, but uh, also to other uh, uh, places. I believe it has some uh, ha, has trouble uh, exporting it. Uh, uh, also, I, I believe on the uh, very small step on the positive side. I think uh, Biden has uh, agreed to refund. Uh, 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 UNRWA, the uh, Palestine uh, refugee uh, uh, organization, uh, and also uh, Rashid Talib uh, recently um, made a strong statement uh, uh, for Palestine in Congress. I think that's uh, uh, well, she should be commended uh, for that. So, but I would believe uh, as a uh, uh, question I'd like you to elaborate more on on the Biden stance on the uh, Iran nuclear deal. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, yeah, I, I think there are some positive aspects to begin with on, on the Palestine side, but the recognition of human rights of Palestinians is not on the agenda. That um, the deaths of Palestinians the, uh, they've gone to great extent to say, you know, th th they they don't count. Um, on, on Iran, what happened was Trump withdrew from the agreement, which was negotiated by Biden by, by Obama, um, and Trump basically said, "Look, we'll renegotiate this agreement, but it's not going to be just over the Iranian nuclear program. It's going to be over." the entire foreign policy of Iran, um, and particularly its um, support of Palestinian rights, the support of the Syrian government and stuff like that. Um, Biden could have gone back and sort of said, okay, we'll go right back and agree with, and go back to the agreement. Um, but what Biden has said, we'll renegotiate the agreement 
But now we're going to re- renegotiate it, not simply narrowly about Iran's nuclear program, but by um, Iran's entire foreign policy. So in effect, um, the, the language is different, but the effect and the intent is the same as the Trump administration. Um, next is Jean, and then Richard W. Okay, I'm on, I gather. Uh, thank you. Very, this was excellent, Roger. It really a thorough an examination. I really appreciate all the work you put into it and your detailed knowledge of so many areas. Um, and, but having said that, um, and I appreciate the fact that you at least cover mentioned China and the possibilities there, but I am uh, perturbed by the fact that you did not even mention Taiwan, which is such a crucial thing right now because the Chinese have said, if you continue to arm Taiwan, there will be war. Uh, And they don't speak lightly of these things. And I also want to just say that uh, on foreign affairs, there's this guy, and I forget his name, but he, uh, in one of his opinions, he he said that um, for the first time in world history, we have a communist country that is uh, the biggest driver of the world economy. And yet we don't know what makes the Communist Party and Xi Jinping tick. And that should be frightening. And he was speaking, of course, of the ruling class, but I think uh, the working class needs to understand that also. And I would also suggest that so much of the left doesn't have a clue about what is driving uh, China. And I think that... Uh, in terms of its foreign policy, as well as all the other nonsense that's being spoken, is accepted by too many people on the left. So that's uh, my provocative comment for the day. But thank you so much, Roger. That was really excellent um, uh, discussion. And I think that the section on East Asia has to be updated a bit, but uh, excellent work. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I I think there's a lot of details to um, the China part, which I just didn't include because of brevity there there's a number of bills i mean there's a 211 billion dollar spending bill that's being put forward uh for war against china so there's a lot of things on china that uh we didn't you know touch on we didn't touch on the propaganda propaganda warfare and stuff like that but I, i i think that mentioning taiwan was one of the things that in that overall offensive, this pivot to Asia, Um, and really the idea that the world, China is emerging as an economic power. The United States position is that um, either it's at the head of the table or the world will be in chaos. And I think it's up to the peoples of the world to make that choice a little bit broader. So thank you, Gene. Thank you, Roger. Um, okay, I appreciate it if people can lower their hands after they speak. Um, next up is Richard W. and then Mark. I'll lower it before I speak. How's that? Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. It was a very good survey. Thank you, Roger. I, I, I appreciate the, uh, uh, you know, especially uh, 120, 130 days into the administration. I mean, um, I had a couple of questions, uh, one of which is um, uh, you mentioned about the, 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 the vaccinations uh, and, 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 and the withholding of, uh, of vaccines from, from various parts of the world, uh, the, the intellectual property rights and that kind of stuff. Uh, one thing you didn't mention, and, and it's, and it's, and it's loath to be mentioned in the mainstream uh, press, is that is that my understanding is the Biden administration is also using vaccinations as a weapon in negotiations uh, that 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 they have that they have told uh, you know their their partners the so called partners that um, if they if they dealt with China if they traded with China that they were not going to get back vaccine from the United States uh, so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and the second question I had is. Uh, there's a flip side to this, and that is 
uh, how U.S. Uh, domestic policy uh, reinforces its foreign policy. And uh, I, I know that's something that may be a little bit off topic, but I think it's a dynamic that, that really needs to be explored. And, and uh, uh, if you could uh, maybe uh, address a little bit of that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Richard. B both points are very well taken. Um, I'm not really up on vaccine imperialism, so I, I, I can't really comment more on that. I wish I could. Um, but the, your other point is, is, is critical, that um, y you can't be kind of like a progressive d domestically and an imperialist internationally. Um, th there's a hand-in-glove relationship and um, so we're seeing the liberals are now become the the new party of war and the new hawks, even though they're so we have um, tremendous amount of imperialist diversity in terms of race, gender and, and nationality in terms of um, who's in charge. But the policies even though they, they meet diversity um, criteria, are, are the same. And by the same, I don't mean that they remain the, um, identical. They are on the same trajectory toward an ever increasingly repressive world order. And uh, thank you. Okay, N next is Mark. Uh, good afternoon, Roger. That was a that that was a wonderful presentation. I'm glad I uh, glad I tapped into this. But I do have a question. Going back to um, the the Palestinian issue, and uh, and I, I want to highlight the fact that Israel is is really creating a greater Israel here. Is, is really what they're doing, and it's not much different than what the United States did with Manifest Destiny. Zionism is virtually <laughs> is virtually a one a one word term for Manifest Destiny at this point. However, I, I, I want to highlight the fact, and I want your reaction to this, that this uh, silly notion of a two-state solution, uh, that's been done for years. Uh, that two-state solution is the civilian government for Israelis and the military for the Palestinians, and I just want your reaction. Um, I, I think on the left, um, the idea of a two-state solution is, is somewhat discredited, um, and that um, most people on the left have a view that there should be a single democratic secular state. So it goes back to really to the foundings of, of the um, Israeli state um, and the idea that it, it should be um, a democratic and secular, a single uh, democratic and secular state, and that there be a, a return, a right of return for the Palestinians. Um, so I think that's the dominant view today in the left, as, as I understand it. I'm not very well informed in that area. Uh, I think the, the other argument is that as solidarity activists, um, we should, that question should be reserved for the protagonists and not, not for the internationals. Um, and I, I, I don't have developed opinions on that. Yeah, but I think at this stage, this idea of a functioning state, which would admit Palestinians, uh, is not going to happen. Just plain not going to happen. I think I don't think that I don't think that's even on the table. No, it, it, the, what's happening right now is the um, elimination of the Palestinian people, and in, in the in the words of Simon Perez, Simon Perez. Um, I hope I got that right. Um, former prime minister of Israel, um, he's looking for the Arabs to disperse like dust on the desert, um, and right. and um, that so that's the the policy, um, and it's of course up to the progressive people in the world to yeah, reverse that policy. It's just like the policy. Indian policy here in the nineteenth century. Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, I'm going to call on Alan and then myself. Go ahead, Alan. Okay, I lowered my hand. Um, I think Richard W. brought up a really, really essential point. I appreciate that you are under time constraints to cover world imperialism policy, but 
I think that the domestic component of this, the developments of that in the recent period with the, with the Democrats coming back into power is so important. And if you could comment a little bit more about that, I think it would be really uh, valuable. It's really an essential point here. Um, I've just been noticing all these really interesting little things. For example, there was, there's been a lot, there's been a push in the uh, mainstream on the uh, anti-Asian hate uh, campaign. And one of the things that I've noticed about that is among all of the um, pieces that have been put out, there's a lot of emphasis on things like the contribution of Asian Americans to the military and sort of the attempt to, to sort of bring people behind the, the military. This is just one slight thing that I've just noticed. And can you comment a little bit more on uh, the domestic component of uh, the shift and how it's manifesting itself? Yeah, I, I, I sort of don't want to put myself up as sort of the expert on, on, on all things. Um, I, I certainly agree with your, your comments, um, but I, I would really invite other people to, um, you don't have to ask a question, you can make a comment. And, and Alan um, put out a challenge of an area that I think really deserves a lot of commentary. Okay, I'm gonna call on myself and then Amit would be next. Um, so I just wanted to add a couple of points on, on Palestine. Um, I think it's what Roger said is very, very important that it's up to the people of that area to um, come to terms and come to grips with it. And it's not up to the US left to, to say, um, what we think is the best thing for them. Although it is important to analyze how, whether it's, whether the, the agreed upon two state solution that, that was supposedly gonna happen after the Oslo Accords um, is, it's okay, it's certainly okay for us to analyze and say whether that's closer or farther away right now. And as far as I'm concerned, it's much farther away because of the continued settlements and the continued expansion of greater Israel. Um, on, on the question of the, on the pivot to Asia, I think another thing that we need to um, look at is another place we need to look at is the Philippines. You know, I have a personal connection with the Philippines. And so I get a translation of the local news every morning of what's going on. So Duterte is terrible, right? We know that he's a right winger. But the opposition, which is trying to come together um, to have one candidate run against him, in which every you know progressive people think that's a good thing, they have just come out criticizing him for not standing up more to China. So he, so from his left, he's being criticized as. Um, as waffling on China, you know, there's the question of what they call the West Philippine Sea, which is otherwise known on maps as the South China Sea. And there's issues around China's role there and fishing rights and a whole lot of other things. And um, that could very well be a um, flashpoint in the U.S. Um, drive to, um, you know, drive, push back against uh, against China. And finally, I wanted to say that I, you know, it's kind of um, the style right now for leftists to say that we're, we're feeling optimistic. Uh, I have to say that I think pessimism is a more realistic response. I, I don't know. I've been um, working in anti-imperialist causes and solidarity international solidarity for a very long time. And it's hard for me to see what, that we've made much progress in educating American people around all the different issues. But I think one issue that seems is people are talking about the tie between domestic and 
and foreign policy. I think one place where that nexus is so important is the whole issue of immigration and the unfinished business that of more than 20 years of uh, dealing with essential workers who are here and who are constantly threatened with, with uh, deportation. And um, that includes, of course, uh, TPS, uh, Temporary Protective Status holders, which is 400,000 people, and um, DACA recipients as well. So I, I think that is the place where right now the domestic and foreign policies um, connect. And it would it's really important for us to think about way, what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong about raising that issue it, among working people. So I'll stop there. And the next person is Ahmet. And then and, uh, Roger's on the stack also. Uh, put Raj after the. Um, I'm sorry, Raj. Raj and then, after. And then Rich, yeah. Rich Johnson. Go ahead, Ahmet. Oh, and let's, uh, uh, Roger, if you want to comment on anything first, go ahead. Go on, please. Okay, Ahmet, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Roger, for uh, presenting this talk. Actually, it has uh, allowed me to think a little bit deeper. So, I mean, uh, there are two questions, actually. One is that I am particularly interested in understanding the connection between imperialism and racism. So you, I mean, uh, raise a very good point that the United States wants to write the rule of the international order. So the judge uh, and jury of everything what is happening in the international field but it has to be connected to the growth of monopoly capital in the sense that the capital accumulation is the agenda here. And uh, when the rate of profit is falling, how to maintain that monopoly capitalism? Uh, that's the major issue here. Now, the thing is that, I mean, uh, one way to understand racism is that that uh, capitalist class uh, cynically exploits this. I mean, they know that it doesn't work, but I mean, since they have to pacify their masses, so they use this. And another way to understand is that uh, it is uh, just the logic of capital in quite impersonal way that uh, capital accumulation itself uh, drives uh, racism and main ideas of racism among both the capitalist classes as well as the masses. So, I mean, I would like to have some opinion about it. I mean, whether it is completely, I mean, in, in, in a sense, what I'm saying is that whether it is a deterministic process where capitalist class does not have any control over the kind of racism which is prevalent or whether it is by choice. Okay, so that is one uh, question which uh, comes to my mind. Another question has to do with uh, the kind of, uh, I mean, I completely seem, I mean, uh, I'm bizarre. Like what I see is that, okay, so China is emerging as a, as a rival. Now the logical conclusion for the US capitalist is to uh, gang up against China. And basically, I mean, in that, is if, they, if they offer Russia, basically a hand that, you know, I mean, uh, why don't I, uh, I mean, you know, collaborate with you and take down China and they can do it anytime they want. Now, the thing is that the usual answer, I also asked this question to Raj uh, one more time. I mean, and then uh, the usual answer from the left is that, that Russia is the only military power which can beat the US. Okay, but the thing is that if you offer Russia a place in the imperialist order, what stops US doing that? I mean, why don't they simply say to China that, you know, I mean, uh, your place is a third world country and I will, you will keep being a third world country. Why the international uh, hegemons are allowing China to emerge as a second uh, world power? So, I mean, you know, so I don't understand what's their long-term goal in, with regard to Russia. 
So can you please elaborate on both these questions? Those are just incredibly important and trenchant <laughs> issues. I, I wish I was up to commenting on them, but let, let me just take a few nibbles. Um, on imperialism and racism, um, there is a, a blog site called the uh, Black Agenda Report Bar. Um, highly highly rec recommend them. Um, uh, um, Glenn Ford, Margaret Kimberly, um, John Mubarak are the leading um, thinkers in that blog site. And they call U.S. imperialism the internationalization of white supremacy. So I, I, I think that's an interesting um, description and, and one that deserves further thought. Um, on this issue of why the, the, the United States and particularly the Democrats have taken such an anti-Russian stance um, when it seems like it, the logic would be to divide Russia and, and China, um, it's unclear why, to me, why that's the case, though I will point out that Russia and China are hardly integrated. That That is that, um, I mean, the United States is far more integrated with the rest of the world economy and the rest of the world of military than Russia and China are with each other. And I mentioned that factoid that only um, some 46% of the trade between Russia and China, two countries who share a common border, is denominated in currencies other than the ruble and the RMB. Um, so it's quite remarkable that Russia and China have not become closer, that um, the, the war games that the United States plays, I mean, the United States is better um, integrated with Morocco than China is with Russia. So that, that's an interesting question. and. and why that is, I think, deserves a lot of more th thought. Um, on the final thing about the, the uh, kind of underlying laws of um, monopoly of, of capitalism and, and this particular stage right now of monopoly capital, um, I, I think it's important to, to keep those in mind, but to understand that those laws have real consequences in the real world. And the, the real consequence I'm speaking about is that there is a world capitalist market. And that's not just a simple, it just sort of happened. The world capitalist market is a market that is controlled by, built by, and administered by the United States. Um, that the world economy is denominated in the US dollar. And this is all very conscious policy. It's kind of invisible to the rest of the world. It just looks like there's a market out there and it's just a, an invisible hand, but there's no invisible hand. That is deliberate policy. And I'll stop there. Um, Raj is next. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I want to agree with you, Roger, that liberals and aggressive imperialism is a link that is important. And it has been there. I mean, I walked into the United States first time when this was happening under Lyndon Baines Johnson, the Vietnam War. So liberalism and imperialism, aggressive imperialism are kind of linked. So uh, because through imperialism, uh, liberals were able to provide for American working class better conditions except times have changed now. They are not able to do that. And uh, in fact, the only way they can provide cheap commodities is production in China, which served them really well. I mean, it served China and it served China could develop its economy. United States could uh, satisfy at least for some time the working class with cheap commodities before they start seeing the job losses and reduction in wages. And so what point at this point it is, is that all this aggressive international uh, posture, and I agree with you, Biden is going more aggressively than Trump. Trump was offering us a racist vision, which means suppress the working class of color and uh, by reducing their wages, you will control everybody. 
and then you don't need to confront the world, which I think in Trump's world is very difficult to do, and I think is more realistic. You cannot cannot really def defeat China and Russia by military means. You will be committing just as much uh, your own self-destruction as you'll destroy them. So it'll be mutual destruction. It's not going to happen. I mean, the, at the periphery, which is where imperialism kept on fighting with the USSR and trying to control, now <laughs> economically that's becoming hard. So all this aggressiveness of the United States, in my opinion, is not self-serving. In fact, will expedite the collapse of the U.S. economy rather than build it. Uh, so the, the point Amit is making is that is that monopoly capital is the basis. This is what imperialism, Lenin defines as monopoly capitalism. And I think we're in a monopoly stage worldwide, major, major countries. So they don't have a choice. They have to have monopoly. If China wants to compete in the world, they have to have monopoly. Russia has to have monopoly. India has to have monopoly. And everybody else is damned. So... Uh, I think it's an impossible project on part of Biden, but he's flailing and I think he's going to fail. That's my observation on him and it's a good thing if he fails. The other thing is, in order to stop this drive towards the war, the left has to organize the working class. So only working class can turn it around. And the problem is the working class is convinced that their enemy is Chinese workers. So here's the problem. So for the left, the challenge is how to oppose the war. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think those are very good points, Raj. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I alluded to that just briefly in, in the presentation when I said that <clears throat> there is, <clears throat> excuse me, an impending crisis of neoliberalism. That we're not there at the crisis. That is, imp neoliberalism is going to continue. It's not, a, it's not like neoliberalism is ended, but it's an impending crisis because it's losing its legitimacy. And we've seen that in a number of manifestations. We've seen that in the rise of the populist right, not only in the United States, but internationally. We've, um, that, that is a response to the, crisis, the impending crisis of neoliberalism. And we've seen it actually in, in left manifestations, in um, the Occupy mo movement, um, which then did not for, take on institutional form, did not take on um, a, a ongoing form. And similarly, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, um, the BLM, um, that also, I think, was a response to the impending crisis of neoliberalism. But again, it didn't take on an a ongoing institutional form. So, the, uh, so I think you're right, Raj, that it's important to address the organizational um, component because clearly the, um, the um, legitimacy of the order is becoming more and more um, illegitimate and there are major physical manifestations of people uprising, but it hasn't taken a, an ongoing um, organizational form, which, which really is the task. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm seeing people who have their hands up who want to speak, who spoke already, but nobody else. So I'm going to call on, I'm sorry if I got this in the wrong order, but uh, Yusuf and Mark, Richard W. and Jean. Go ahead, Yusuf. Uh, okay, uh, I have trouble with the term neoliberalism when it's spoken by uh, uh, American English speakers. Neoliberalism was coined in Europe, where liberalism means a, uh, a laissez-faire capitalist, a laissez-faire capitalism. There are many right-wing parties with columns of liberal uh, in, uh, in, um, in countries other than the U.S. Uh, he, Trump was a very uh, neoliberal economically. Uh, which means, uh, we, we, I mean, he, he wanted to uh, do away with the uh, post office. You know, I, I, it's difficult to get more neoliberal than Trump 
in the European sense. Uh, he, here uh, in the US, liberal uh, meant uh, event or eventually came to me mean these watered down social democrats. And um, the, the Biden policy has made some uh, 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 steps in, in the direction, uh, non trivial steps. Um, uh, in, in the direction of uh, return to Keynesian economics, uh, rather than, uh, well, okay, these uh, recovery packages and also uh, the infrastructure package that's pending. Uh, so um, uh, maybe we should use a new term to describe uh, Biden as the new liberals, uh, where they are very aggressive uh, uh, in promoting uh, uh, imperialism, but also uh, a, a has still have some sense of uh, uh, Keynesian economics and also uh, this uh, veneer of equal opportunity. Yeah, I, I think you're, you make a good point there, Yosef. It, it, neoliberalism is kind of a sloppy shorthand for um, a, a lot of different things. I, I came to the term actually through Latin America, where it became uh, popular on the left to use that term, um, and then it became more popular and introduced into the United States. Um, but I, I think when we speak of neoliberalism, mainly we, we speak of what uh, Amit and, and Raj were talking about, the, the particular stage of capitalism that we're in right now. Oh, and ne next, next person. Um, the next person is Mark. What about me? I know what or what I do. I can't raise my hand. Okay, Nina, I'll put you on the stack. Fine. Thank you. Actually, Nina hasn't spoken, so maybe she That's goes right. to the top, top of the if, stack. If you want Nina to go first, go right ahead. Okay, thank you all. Uh, Nina, go ahead. Okay, well, my concern is that uh, I've seen, you know, I'm a third generation uh, communist uh, because of my um, uh, relatives, et cetera. So I've seen this tendency on the new left, the new old left, of just emphasizing international politics. Now, this is a broad statement that's very simple, but I would like much more coverage of what's happening in the United States and what's happening to us. Because we're seeing, we see ourselves, or somehow you guys see yourselves as terribly privileged. But I don't see it that way, okay? And I can go on about that, but I won't. And, um, and I just find it to be so... How should I say? I'm not trying to say exactly condescending, but somehow condescending to the American working class. I'm very glad you're having something about uh, union organizing um, uh, with Amazon, etc. But uh, the uh, sort of view that you uh, that we somehow and that doesn't include me have to have a whole world of, of sort of looking at other countries when we can't even take care of our own and and. And I'm talking about the medical system and, and the whole business with opiates and everything. And that includes me. All right. And um, it's just hideous. And um, I, I just uh, am uh, abhorrent of some of what the left, you know, is standing on some kind of a pedestal looking down at the world um, uh, as if international politics are, you know, and we don't matter. I matter, you know. And my health care matters. And the kinds of things that have happened are, are outrageous. So, I mean, I could get more specific, but I'm not going to. So that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Th th thank you very much, Nina. Okay. Um, Mark is next. Yeah. Uh, based somewhat on what Nina just, Nina just brought up, but also for what Richard and Alan alluded to earlier about domestic policy melding with foreign policy. And yes, uh, it, if, and, and the stark, the stark, uh, what's, what's emblematic about this, and it's stark, is that when you go back to 1941, 1945, uh, which was probably the, 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 uh, a, a more, uh, the greatest example of a community scene this country's ever seen, yet how do you maintain allegiance to what America's really turned into an empire? Well, you build two armies. One for overseas adventures, the other 
to rein in an ungrateful population, and that's the militarized police. That's where we've gone. Uh, you know, the, the idea of, of, of mom's apple pie, God bless America, America the beautiful, 1941-45, that's dead. And I don't think enough Americans understand this. Of course, now they're divorced from foreign policy. And when Richard was talking about Afghanistan, uh, you know, for every American soldier in Afghanistan, I mean, I do historical research at Army Aviation Magazine, and for every American soldier in Afghanistan, there's seven contractors. You know, so, and so when you understand that perspective, that, you know, GIs, Marines, are, 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 are take an oath to a flag and constitution, uh, contractors get, are, 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 are allied to what? A check? What kind of foreign policy is that? Yeah, good, good points. Good. And thank you. Um, next on the stack is Richard W. And, um, and I wanted to follow up. I mean, it, it, it worked out that Mark sort of, um, uh, I was pressing and what I was going to, what I was going to get to. Uh, and that is that, uh, it goes back to uh, 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 Eisenhower warned about the, the rise of the military industrial complex back uh, when he left office, uh, back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. Um, and then it was carried on again by uh, Martin Luther King, who, you know, at, at, at his address at the Riverside Church talked about, about how we were, uh, you know, not only were we exporting violence, but we were importing it by our export exportation. Right. Let me let me go back uh, and and uh, one of the things that I think Mark kind of missed is that uh, he mentioned about the, about the privatization of of uh, locking people up uh, of criminal just criminal justice um, and he talked about the the uh, uh, military industrial um, uh, you know foreign wise but one of the other things he missed is that uh, is that our a large measure of our economy now. Is this military, industrial, and I would now include the security uh, complex uh, that basically pays? You know, if you want to hit the working class, that's where the working class is these days. It's they're they're all they're all well, not all, but they're in large measure working for these military, industrial. They have a they have a um, uh, they have a vested interest in in, in maintaining. Um, both, both, uh, both export and military, uh, which goes to you know goes back to the Yemen, uh, you know the military sales to Yemen, um, and as well as 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 at back home we have the privatization of the of the prison industry. So I'll I'll, I'll leave it at that and and uh, whatever comments uh, uh, follow. Thank you. I'm really glad that you raised that, Richard, because. Um Particularly, you, you might know this group called the Black Alliance for, for um, Peace, uh, BAP. It's, it's, uh, their national spokesman is, is a John Mubaraka. Um, they consider probably the, the key issue today, and they're joined by the U.S. Peace Council, which I'm, I'm involved in. Um, the key issue today is militarism. That, that really is the kind of pivot around the, both the domestic and the and the international issue. Um, there's a, an increasing penetration of, of militarism. Um, I, I didn't mention in, in in the presentation, but it should be mentioned that Obama that Biden's um, war budget is larger than Trump's war budget, um, uh, and 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 th that's in the situation where there, there was no external enemy, um, and. Um, the and uh, a, a vast majority of the U.S. Uh, uh, discretionary budget, the federal discretionary budget, is uh, is related to the military, and um, as you said, the uh, Democrats have now become the the supporters of the military, and that when there is a chance for peace to break out, everybody gets panicky. Um, and that the military is 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 
the police have become militarized when we look at the events of January 6th and the state in, in the national ca capital. Um, the, the liberals were arguing that the the military was not called in strongly enough and quick enough, rather than saying that the military should not have been brought in for a domestic issue. Um, so that, that, that whole issue of militarism is really, I think, a, a pivot of, 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 of concern. But can, I, can I just uh, amend something here too, Roger? Please. Uh, and, that, and that is, is that uh, you mentioned about Trump's withdrawing, uh, you know, uh, had his, he wanted to withdraw for, uh, militarily. I never really read it as withdrawing. I read it as he wanted to shift, uh, shift the burden of the military budget worldwide to other NATO members. And that he wanted to set the United States up as a, you know, in sales, military sales. Uh, so, and, 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 you know, keep the money back home. So, uh, so in that respect, I, I guess I differ maybe from, from, uh, from, from the, the Trump uh, people, but our interpretation of Trump. Yeah, I, I purposely did that in the presentation to be a bit provocative. Um, just what Trump's in intentions were. Um, it's pretty obscure, but I, I would very much like to hear commentary about that from, from the other comrades. Uh, this is Gary speaking. Uh, Gary, I'll put you on this. Oh, go ahead. You haven't spoken yet. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the discussions of the last, say, 15 to 20 minutes have been borderlining on, on a common theme. And that theme is that most people on the left who are, you know, or most people who are progressive activists and so on know jack about the history of the United States and its relationship to the international capitalist order for the last 500 years, actually. And we need some, we need some folks in our Sunday sessions who will be able to um, talk about some, some of these aspects of, some aspects of this. That's all I have to say. Um, okay. Gene. Yeah, thank you. And I do have a couple of interrelated comments. The first is on neoliberalism. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. If uh, Trump wants to, or, or Biden wants to do neoliberalism, he should do neoliberalism and contract things out. For example, infrastructure. Who does infrastructure better than the Chinese? <laughs> they should give Xi Jinping a call. Healthcare. Who does healthcare better than the Cubans? So they contact the Communist Party of Cuba. So uh, I'm putting this forward a little bit as uh, humorous. I know they're not gonna do that, but I think that's what I wanted to say on neoliberalism. Secondly, I'm kind of plugged in to the Chinese community for a variety of ways, partly through Best for Peace. And I know people are really being terrorized in the Chinese community. I have one comrade to, who is a war resistor during the Vietnam period and spent most of the war in Sweden uh, because if he returned to the United States, he would have been sent straight to the stockades. And he's really worried if war breaks out, they're gonna do to the Chinese what they did to the Japanese, lock them all up in concentration camps. And he's seriously considering moving to China. He was he's born in a uh, Chinatown in the United States, in San Francisco. but. That's, you know, a real scary thing. And the last thing I just wanted to say is there's this guy, Kishore Madhubani. He uh, was the Singapore ambassador to the United Nations. And he has a book out that's titled, How's the West Lost It? And basically his answer is yes, West has lost it, but they don't realize it. And that's what's causing the problems. And just on that connection, one of uh, Biden's comments says, was something to the effect of recognizing 
the, the growth of China and it's going to replace the United States as a leading power. And he said, but it's not going to happen in my watch. And I think uh, that's, again, something scary. So I just wanted to, particularly some of the other comments in terms of what's the impact of Biden's policies, both domestically and in foreign affairs. So that, thank you again. Um, Yusuf, your hand is up. Did, did you want to say something more? Uh, yes, please. I, I, I'd like to uh, respond a, a, a little bit more to Nina. Uh, I, I agree that uh, uh, many left groups are mention, mention anything but the uh, class struggle, uh, and the class struggle is essential. Uh, uh, it's the basis. But um, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, we, 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 one must uh, impress upon the working class that uh, 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 imperialism and their, their everyday lives are interconnected. You, they cannot get the uh, uh, social services they demand uh, if uh, everything goes to the military budget, i.e. imperialism. Uh, and in New Haven, actually, we are building up, uh, a, we're trying to uh, build up a movement uh, that uh, is dual track. Uh, in, in Connecticut, actually. Uh, also nationwide, but it's most uh, intense in New Haven than the rest of Connecticut. Uh, second, uh, uh, I'd like to briefly respond to Mark. Uh, there, uh, okay, uh, basically, I understand what he's saying, and I basically agree with him uh, that two-state solution is repeated as a broken record uh, but uh, and getting nowhere. Uh, but what's keeping uh, uh, it alive uh, for, uh, and what the Palestinians still want to keep it alive, there are two good reasons. Um, one, uh, uh, it, 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 not talking about it will justify the uh, uh, present Israeli occupation and then I'll uh, allow it to expand. Uh, 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 second, uh, Israel's uh, long-term goal is to just uh, erase the identity of Palestinians altogether. And uh, the uh, discourse of the two-state solution uh, keeps us alive. It gives uh, a uh, anchor for Palestinians uh, 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 to maintain uh, their identity in the face of things. So, uh, and, and third, um, there's a diplomatic consensus uh, about it. Uh, many countries are uh, tied, uh, have uh, extensive trade relations with Israel that as countries, they're not willing to give up. Uh, a, but uh, it's a complex issue, and maybe uh, a, 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 some venue will be should be um, uh, found to discuss it. And I, I could provide that uh, venue myself, actually. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted I wanted to comment on the contradiction that Nina pointed to. So I think it was Engels who talked about, or was it Lenin, who talked about the aristocracy of labor, the stratification within the working class, which is used to keep us um, fighting each other instead of uniting. So in addition to racism, there is, you know, uh, intellectual workers or college educated workers are pitted against industrial workers who, who don't have college degrees um, and uh, et cetera. There's a, strat a very great stratification within the US working class. And also there's the, con the dialectic of the US working class as a whole is somewhat an aristocracy vis-a-vis -vis 
the international working class in general. Although some would argue that European workers or Western European workers are better off than American workers. Um, so I would say that. Um, yeah, so there's the stratification and a, a relative privilege around the world in the U.S. working class that it sometimes, you know, we, we sound, those of us who are trying to be objective and have a material analysis, we might sound like we're saying that we're all privileged here in the U.S., but of course, there's that other contradiction of the stratification where a lot of people in the U.S. working class are not benefiting at all from the profits of capital. Um, so let me just let me call on Anne because you haven't spoken yet. Anne, go ahead. I feel like I've been speaking a lot in the chat, but I don't know if Nina can see the chat. Um, uh, but I. <laughs> You know, I think this question of privilege becomes very difficult when you look at who's actually working in this country. We would not call immigrant workers privileged, um, particularly not undocumented um, immigrant workers. We would not call workers in nursing homes and, um, and child care centers and other service workers privileged. We would not call the people that have risked their lives every day from the pandemic in order to keep the economy going, so-called. Really, most of them are not essential, but you know they're considered that way. Um, you know, there are an awful lot. Uh, we would not call coal miners, even if they're well paid, um, who die of black lung disease and other occupational uh, injuries um, and have their environment devastated around them. Um, privileged. So I think it all depends on how you consider privilege and how you present it to people. And I think what I'm raising is that I both agree and disagree with Nina in this question of, do we have a privileged working class in this country? Well, first of all, I don't think of a white working class versus a black working class, even though, or um, a Latino working class or whatever even though I think that that is the way that people begin thinking about labor and they, the way they begin thinking about uh, the US working class. Um, I think that in fact, most workers in this country are female, are either African-American, Asian or Latino, <laughs> or African in the case of nursing homes, I think. African immigrant, I think, uh, or South Asian. I mean, I really do think that we have a very complex working class that is not privileged in this country. And that in some ways represents the working classes of every country that we've exploited, because this is where people come when they can't survive in their own economies. And that's the tie, I think, in part with immigration. And I also think it's the tie with imperialism. We function as imperialists. We end up with workers from those countries where we act imperialists right here, creating incredible inequalities in our own country. I mean, we have, we have a very um, integrated country. We may, be, we may be in the belly of the beast here. We may have a very privileged capitalist class, but I think that we are absolutely, our fortunes are tied to working people all over the world. Thank you. Um, let me see. Um, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Okay, um, Jean and then Mark. Okay, thank you. Uh, just want to say a couple of things. First of all, on the question of privilege, um, uh, again, there are some of us in America who are workers who are far less oppressed. And I consider myself very fortunate that I do have a good retirement plan and all that stuff. So, but that is not characteristic of workers generally in the United States. Secondly, when Marx and Lenin talked about the working class united, they didn't say workers of the United States unite. 
they said, workers of the world unite. And the largest working class in the world is the Chinese working class, followed closely by the Indian working class. So Asian workers are by far the largest working class in the world. And speaking for the Chinese situation, they are also the best, the best organized and the most effective. They have the largest trade union organization in the world. The All Federation of Chinese Workers is, uh, has 302 million members, uh, almost the size of the United States itself. The Chinese Communist Party, a working class party that knows its Marxism very well, um, has over 90 million members or almost 6% of the Chinese population. So I think there needs to be, when we talk about workers, we need to remember it's workers of the world and we need to take this into consideration in our thinking. Uh, so I'll stop there, but maybe come back later. Okay, um, Mark. Back later. Oh, and Roger, you should just jump in if you want to comment. Yeah, you know, I just want to, uh, uh, Gary Hicks brought up a brilliant point about 10 minutes ago about uh, referencing, if I'm not mistaken, is what he's referencing here about Americans don't even know their own history as to as to as to a lead in as to what uh, America's become now. And he's quite correct here. Uh, when and I give talks on this back here all the time, and America started out with with two doctrines: the Jeffersonian notion of the agrarian as the salt of the earth. The person who digs in the dirt is the best protector of Republican limited elective government. The alternative was the Hamiltonian notion of industrial capitalism slash finance. One set up shop in the South. One set up shop in the North. That was what led to the war in 1861. Yeah, exactly. That led to the war. Slavery was important, but slavery was the engine of agrarian capitalism below the Mason-Dixon line. And so right. we saw it develop up north. That is going to divide this country through the first part of the 19th century. But when the war starts, which really is the Civil War, I call it the revolt of the planters because that's really the Confederacy was a revolution from the right, not the left. However, the North is going to win. And, the North, and so the Hamiltonian notion wins. You can't expect a nation of farmers in a, in, in a modern conventional war. They're going to beat a nation of wrench turners. Not going to happen. And so what America did in 1861-65 with the, and this was an industrial, this got to be an industrialized conflict. It's a mirror image of what's going to happen in 1914 and again in 1939. Although that'll be on steroids by comparison. But afterwards, 1865, the Hamiltonian notion is going to take off. And by the mid 1890s, America is the world's leading industrial power. We had kicked the British out of first place. But it also helps to lead to what? A war nobody talks about, the Spanish-American War. And that's where America takes, uh, takes the, the Monroe Doctrine and manifest destiny. You know, this idea of the American leading, the Amer average everyday Americans leading this surge across this, across this land is no longer going to happen anymore. You know, it's not mom, pa, kettle grabbing land anymore after 1898. It's the army, the Navy, and the banks. That's where we went. But the basic notion of this starts 1787, 1790, and it's going to divide the country in 1860-61. So Gary's quite correct here bringing this up. He really is. Oh, for Richard, one more point. Hey, Richard, you, you brought up... Uh, brought up um, uh, President Eisenhower and the and the uh, and the 1961 warning on the military industrial complex. Ur I urge you to read George Washington's farewell address of 1796 because I've been giving talks on this too, where he warned he warned 225 years ago, beware over bloated militaries; they are inauspicious to liberty. Right. It's an interesting address to read. Thank you, Mark. Um, Norma, I'll call on you because you haven't spoken yet. Go ahead. You call on me because I have something important to say. 
I put a I put a link up to the yeah Nina's uh, uh, you got your your uh, mute button off and you talking to other people. Um, the I put a link up about what has been going on in Afghanistan. The Afghanistan, uh, the assault against Afghanistan began in 1953 when Afghanistan began an alliance with the Soviet Union, uh, established a government that was aligned with the Soviet Union and drove our owners crazy as they've done about every liberatory event that's ever occurred. Uh, they've been mad about Afghanistan since then. Um, the problem was that the a action in Afghanistan liberated the women, took the women, the quote, <laughs> took the women away from the Mujahideen, give us our women back. And uh, things proceeded from there. There's been the conflict rising ever since then and invasion and uh, oh, yeah, they talk about uh, a Soviet invasion into Afghanistan. And, of course, the opposite is the case, uh, as the same is true of uh, Ukraine and all. The uh, people in Afghanistan wanted, and there was conflict over this, wanted the Soviet government, Soviet-style government, and uh, the resistance against it. Uh, became a movement. Uh, one of the problems we have to watch out for is the way we speak of, the way we urge any kind of compromises, the way we stand down from definitive opposition to our owner's policies, diseducates or furthers the diseducation of the of our populace, you know, takes over what they know, and they start reciting all those uh, policies as though they're correct and have substance. Uh, there was one in particular. I'll forget it. Maybe I'll post it when I remember. It'll take a minute. Thank you. Um, we have now reached um, our two-hour mark, and I think we should. Um, end the recording, but before we do that, I want to ask Roger if he has any final thoughts on the discussion. You're muted, Roger. Uh, th thank you, Sharon. Um, I, I thought this was a, a fruitful discussion. I really appreciate the comments and questions from comrades. Um, and I, I think that the take home message is that we, we have to resist imperialism. Thank you. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, 
Oakland, California, 94609. Or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org.